How many astronauts have died while in orbit? There is no question that outer space is very perilous, but very few people have actually perished there. The concept of setting out into the vast unknown would be the stuff of dreams for many would-be astronauts. However, there have been other space-related disasters during the past 50 years that are more equivalent to an astronaut's worst nightmare. About 30 astronauts and cosmonauts have perished in the past 50 years while preparing for or trying perilous space missions. However, the vast majority of these fatalities took place either on or inside the Earth's atmosphere, below the Kármán line, which is thought to be the established boundary of space and starts at an altitude of roughly 62 miles. However, just three of the approximately 550 people who have traveled into space so far have really perished there. The three cosmonauts accomplished a historic feat, but their demise and subsequent silence remained a mystery. Could it have been prevented that they died? After they vanished, what became of their bodies? Let's investigate the fate of the rocket that mysteriously disappeared 52 years ago, but now lands with three skeletons on board. Several pilots testing cutting-edge rocket-powered planes for NASA and the USSR perished in a spate of early fatal jet crashes. The Apollo 1 fire in January 1967 was another tragedy, taking the lives of astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. The pure, oxygen-filled cabin of the stranded spaceship caught fire during a launch practice. Tragically, this caused the crew's terrible deaths as they tried in vain to open the pressurized hatch door in the face of an out-of-control fire. Seven more Apollo flights were completed during the next three years, including the historic Apollo 11 moon landing and the doomed Apollo 13 mission. The first, and to this day only, fatalities in space were witnessed by Earthlings on June 30, 1971. By this time, the great space race between the United States and the Soviet Union had been effectively ended by the 1969 Apollo 11 moon landing. In the 1960s, there was a fad for space exploration, which gave rise to a wide range of cultural phenomena, including Star Trek. People simply stopped caring after the moon race. Many voiced concerns that our resources would be better put to use addressing issues closer to home. There was still a lot of uncharted territory in space and many records to be broken. The effects of long-term weightlessness on the human body, for instance, were not well understood by scientists. Prior to the historic moon landing, the longest duration anyone had spent in space was around two weeks. The Soviet Union was perpetually concerned with the consequences of human spaceflight. Without knowing how the human body will react, it would be foolish to even consider traveling somewhere like Mars. After falling behind in the race to the moon, the Soviet Union immediately shifted its focus to building a space station. They assembled a space station using pre-existing parts and launched it into orbit on April 19, 1971. Salyut 1 was the first space station ever built, and it orbited the planet. However, on March 25, 1961, an ejector seat dropped from a space capsule and landed in the countryside not far from Perm, an old city in the heart of Soviet Russia. A rescue team, with the help of some nearby villagers, tracked down the wreckage of the craft in the snow and rescued the trapped passenger. Who was this unidentified astronaut anyway? There had been no manned space flights yet. Could it come from another world? Or even worse, perhaps it came from the decadent West. The previous summer, an American U-2 spy plane had been shot down and its pilot, Gary Powers, paraded before the world media. What if this mysterious visitor was a spy? The craft's descent was announced by a loud noise that resembled an anti-aircraft rocket. The authorities told the interested to go since it was merely a dummy. Rescuers raced to the deceased guy in the odd flight suit and they eventually arrived at the ejector seat. Ivan Ivanovich, a Russian name for John Doe, was sitting there. Ivan had a sign on him, just one word, make it, model. Ivan was a dummy. A filmmaker hired to capture the flight remembered the anger felt by the volunteer rescuers when they realized their efforts had been in vain. Unlike later cosmonauts, Ivan wasn't greeted upon his return to Earth with a salute or a bouquet. Instead, he took a punch to the face. Ivan Ivanovich was a pilot for Karabl Sputnik 5, a test mission that served as a prelude to the Soviet Union's Vostok program, which was intended to launch the first astronaut ahead of the Americans. This was a flight test, dummy's second flight. Ivan's identical twin had been used in the first, which had happened on March 9th. 
When it came to the Soviet program, secrecy was legendary. The flow of information on flights was strictly regulated. On the one hand, the Soviets were able to leverage this air of secrecy to their advantage since it's simpler to claim success when there is no publicly announced timetable to meet. On the other side, it fostered an environment conducive to speculation and rumor. A conspiracy theory, known as the Lost Cosmonaut Conspiracy, gained traction in this climate of secrecy, eager anticipation of human spaceflight, and Cold War fears. The Lost Cosmonaut Conspiracy was so pervasive that it affected how the media covered real Soviet space disasters, like the Soyuz 11 cruise fatalities. From the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Soviet Kazakhstan, the Soviet Union launched the Salyut space station on April 19, 1971. It was designed to last for only six months. A total of 2,600 pounds of scientific equipment, including experiments to study human adaptation to long-duration spaceflight, various telescopes for solar and astronomical observations, and instruments to observe Earth, were packed into the space station's 3,500 cubic feet of habitable volume. The 43-foot-long space station weighed 40,620 pounds. Crew members donned special costumes that applied steady stress to their major muscle groups while also working out on a treadmill and with elastic bands. More food options were available to crews thanks to a refrigerator and food warmer than on any previous Soviet spacecraft. On April 23rd, the first cosmonauts flew to Salyut on board Soyuz 10, but they were unable to dock with the space station due to a technical issue and had to return to Earth two days later. The following time they tried, it was in southern Kazakhstan during a very perfect June. Recent rainfall had been accompanied by an unseasonably chilly breeze. Tayuratom's longtime residents naturally claimed they had no recollection of June being that mild and lovely. To prevent a repeat of the Soyuz 10 disaster, Soviet engineers swiftly rebuilt the docking probe and modified docking protocols. Alexei A. Leonov, Valery N. Kubasov, and Pyotr Tsurskolodin, all with extensive spaceflight experience, continued training for their upcoming 25-day mission to Salyut, set to launch on June 6. However, during Kubasov's pre-flight physical at the Baikonur Cosmodrome three days before launch, physicians saw a dark area on his chest X-ray. Flight doctors were concerned that it was tuberculosis and grounded Kubasov. Managers discussed whether to replace simply Kubasov or all three cosmonauts with their backups, similar to the days leading up to the Apollo 13 launch, despite operational guidelines stating that once crews were at Baikonur, the complete crew must be replaced. Managers opted to switch out the entire crew two days before liftoff. Thus, on June 6, backups Georgi T. Dobrovolsky, Vladislav N. Volkov, the only member of the crew with spaceflight experience, and Viktor Lot. Patsayev took off on Soyuz 11. The initial diagnosis of tuberculosis for Kubasov was eventually disproven by doctors. Dobrovolsky piloted Soyuz 11 to Salyut the day after liftoff and manually docked without issue. Patsayev entered the world's first space station three hours later, when the crew opened the door and equalized pressures between the Soyuz and Salyut. A foul odor had him heading back to Soyuz after exploring Salyut. Crew communicator cosmonaut Alexei S. Yeliseyev in the flight control center in Yevpatoria, Crimea, instructed his colleagues to activate the station's air regenerators. Patsayev and Volkov rapidly fixed the six fans that had failed shortly after Salyut's launch, and they rejoined Dobrovolsky on Soyuz for the night as the station's air cleared. They returned to Salyut the following day to activate its systems and shut down their Soyuz, which they would not use again until the mission's conclusion. Over the next three weeks, the three cosmonauts would evaluate their health, conduct experiments, and get in some exercise on the space station's treadmill. The cosmonauts took shifts sleeping so that at least one was always awake and engaged in study. Scientists from the Soviet Union eventually determined that the cosmonauts' performance suffered because of the lack of sleep they were allowed to get during the day. Patsayev was the first person to operate a telescope in space when he used the Orion 1 ultraviolet instrument to observe the growth of Chinese cabbage and onions in the Oasis 1 plant growth facility. After using a lower body negative gadget called Vader to assess their cardiovascular health, they moved on to the Chibis apparatus, which is still in use on the Russian part of the International Space Station today. They took breath tests and blood samples at regular intervals to analyze later. 
Nearly every day, the cosmonauts broadcasted live on television, giving Soviet audiences a glimpse into their lives and the scientific studies they were conducting inside the Salyut space station. The events were called Cosmovision by the Soviet press. They were the first individuals to vote from space when they participated in Soviet elections from the space station Salyut. On June 16th, the crew responded to a small electrical fire in the station's back that received little attention at the time. The smoke from the fire, which the crew eventually extinguished, caused some brief fear that the trip would have to be cut short. The mission resumed after hazardous substances in the air were removed by the station's air rejuvenation system. On June 19th, Patsayev became the first person to ever celebrate his birthday in space. When he turned 38 years old, Volkov had sneaked an onion and a lemon aboard the Soyuz 11 spacecraft which Dobrovolsky and Volkov gave to him. After five days in space, they surpassed the Soyuz 9 crew's previous record of 18 days in space, achieved in June 1970. Cosmonaut Andrian G. Nikolaev, who was on board the Soyuz 9 and acted as the ship's communicator, extended his congratulations. Dobrovolsky, Volkov, and Patsayev spent the next few days getting Salyut ready for a period of automated operations in anticipation of their return to Earth. Late on June 29th, after preparing video and samples for return to Earth, the crew reactivated their Soyuz spacecraft and sealed the hatch between Salyut and their return vessel. Yelisayev took the crew through the steps necessary to reopen the hatch and clear the seals of any foreign object that might be inhibiting a firm seal after a light on the instrument panel showed that the hatch to their descent module had not sealed correctly. Ground control and the crew were confident the hatch was properly sealed, so the cosmonauts undocked their Soyuz from Salyut even though the indicator light remained on. Flying around the space station, the crew filmed and photographed their home for the past three weeks. Dobrovolsky flipped the spacecraft around so it was traveling backward, then fired the retro rocket for 187 seconds to slow it down for re-entry after it had freely orbited the Earth three times. At an altitude of almost 80 miles, nine minutes after the burn ended, explosive bolts split the Soyuz into its three halves with the crew safely ensconced in the center bell-shaped descent module. At this very moment, 30 minutes before landing, a catastrophe occurred. A pressure equalization valve was jolted open by the explosive bolts, which would have typically opened once the spacecraft was deep within the atmosphere and descending on its parachute. However, the capsule's air was released into space in under a minute as the valve opened. Manually closing the valve would have taken several minutes, although there is evidence that the cosmonauts attempted to do so in response to the emergency. They were unconscious quickly as the pressure dropped and passed away within two minutes. They would have died in an instant if they hadn't been wearing pressure suits. There was concern on the ground about the lack of voice communication with the crew, but the capsule resumed its descent in an automated mode. The three men inside the descent module situated themselves, the parachute opened, and the ship touched down gently in the early hours of June 30, 1971, in the steppes of Kazakhstan. The cosmonauts were in peak physical condition in their final days of the mission, according to a report, as Chertok relates in his biography. Unfortunately, the cosmonauts' deaths were the result of several errors made by the ship's crew and the Soviet space program. The capsule achieved a safe landing 320 miles east of Zhezkazgan in Soviet Kazakhstan thanks to the deployment of its parachute and rescue aircraft landed nearby. The rescue crew contacted the module two minutes after landing. While it lay on its side, they popped the top fast. There was a sense of calm as the three of them sat in their chairs. Their faces were covered in blue dots. Both of his ears and nose were bleeding profusely. They were rescued by pulling the descent module open. Dobrovolsky felt pleasantly toasty. Artificial resuscitation was still being attempted by the doctors. Asphyxiation was the cause of death, according to accounts from the landing site. Afterward, an autopsy report left a harrowing impression. Everyone sought to put themselves in the cosmonaut's shoes for those initial few seconds by imagining themselves inside the descent module. The unbearable suffering they were experiencing rendered them incapable of reasoning. The whistling of the exiting air could be heard, but their eardrums quickly ruptured. And then there was complete quiet. Based on how quickly the air pressure dropped, they probably had around 15-20 seconds to get themselves together and try to do anything. About 105 miles up, over the Karman Line, 
a made-up border intended to denote the beginning of space travel, the valve opened. To this day, only three people, Dobrovolsky, Volkov, and Patsayev, have died beyond that line. The three men would have had a much better chance of surviving the depressurization if they had been wearing spacesuits. However, the mission ran into trouble due to a lack of testing, which was caused in part by the urgency brought on by the space race. There are many problems with the spaceship that won't become apparent right away. Sometimes you have to run the test 50 times before any problems become apparent. Therefore, they did not have enough experience flying these to know how they would respond. The Soviet government posthumously presented the Hero of the Soviet Union Medal to Dobrovolsky, Volkov, and Patsayev. On July 1st, thousands of mourners filed through the flower-covered beers bearing the bodies of the three cosmonauts as they lay in state in the central house of the Soviet army in Moscow. After cremation, a state burial was held in their honor on Red Square, and their remains were entombed in the Kremlin Wall. Several cosmonauts, notably Leonov and Georgi T. Beregovoy, hosted President Nixon's representative at the funeral, astronaut Thomas P. Stafford, less than two years later, in July 1975. For the historic handshake in space, the Americans and the Soviets identified Stafford and Leonov as the respective commanders of the Apollo and Soyuz spacecraft. The two became fast friends after experiencing something in common. Apollo 15 astronauts David R. Scott and James B. Irwin deployed a plaque and a statuette at the Hadley Apennine landing site on the moon on August 2, 1971, exactly one month after the funeral for the Soyuz 11 cosmonauts. The plaque and statuette honored all astronauts and cosmonauts who had lost their lives in space, including Dobrovolsky, Volkov, and Patsayev. In 1973, the Soviet authorities erected a memorial to the crew of Soyuz 11 at the site in Kazakhstan where they touched down. Due to its isolated location, 16 miles from the nearest road, it was vandalized and its copper was stolen in 2008. A new granite memorial was unveiled in the same location in 2016 by Russian and Kazakh officials with the following inscription. In the words of one author, the feet of the brave sons of the Soviet people, cosmonauts G.T. Dobrovolsky, V.N. Volkov, Sixt Patsayev, committed in the name of the triumph of science for the good of all mankind, will forever remain in the grateful memory of people all over the planet. The Soyuz Koles range of hills on Pluto and the Dobrovolsky, Volkov and Patsayev craters on the moon are all named after them. The loss of the three cosmonauts forever altered the course of the Soviet Union's space program. More than two years passed before another attempt at flight. Although the loss of life is obviously undesirable, it may have been the only thing that gave the designers a moment to catch their breath. By the late 1970s, space travel was completely safe. The Soviets' 1977 launch of the Salyut 6 space station was an undeniable success with multiple large crews successfully docking and undocking with the station, and mission lengths gradually increasing from three to six months. Fortunately, the Soviet Union and the Russian Federation have not had another deadly space tragedy since Soyuz 11, and the successive redesigns and modifications to the Soyuz capsules, including spacesuits for ascent and descent, have been very durable. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.